And we're live. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> just as I go live, the buzzer rings. Ah, forget it. Oh, no, I've got to get that. Hello. I'm about to go live again. Look. See? Hello. One minute, guys. Can you take Frida? And then I'm going to lock the door while I go live for a bit. No, I just need. <laughs> that was amazing. Just as I went live, the door opens and get home. <laughs> I've only just got back myself. I uh, went on a big walk around Albuquerque. Took the boys to the dentist and then we played at the park. Hello, Claire. Hello, Jennifer. So I am going to be basically rambling on about things that I'm interested in, but I thought it'd also be a good idea for you guys to come up with like a subject, uh, I don't know, like you could just say tree or star or human, anything, and then I'll try and share what I know about it in an interesting way. So you're helping me learn to be a better teacher and storyteller, which is essentially my ambition for life, <laughs> to learn interesting things and then share it with other people oh and to eat more cheesecake because cheesecake <laughs> all right let's see where should we start today hmm cheesecake is amazing sorry i'm gonna start with cheesecake All right, I just had to reconnect. Are you there? <laughs> Is it working? No? Anybody there? Hello? Okay, it's better now? Good, right. Where were we? Cheesecake. I've got a strawberry cheesecake. That's my dad's favorite. My favorite is chocolate cheesecake. But essentially, Food, why do we need to eat it? Well, <laughs> where do I start with that? So food gives us energy, duh, we know that, but how? Because the food itself has chemical energy, and our body can use that chemical energy and turn it into other things like kinetic energy so that we can move. And the nutrition, which is basically the different chemicals inside of food, give our body the ingredients our body needs to stay ourself. Because we're not just made of uh, bones, muscles, and blood. We're made of much smaller things that make up those things. For example, blood is made out of water, iron, and some other things. And things like iron, there's not a lot of in our body. So we need to eat food to replenish what we lose to stay alive. Because to stay alive, it costs uh, resources. A bit like how a car needs to be fueled up regularly to keep, the, to keep the car going. It's a bit like that. Or a bit like putting oil in the tank every now and then to top it up. Well, that's what food does for us. But an interesting fact about food is that fat, like that I have, is stored energy so we can use it at a later date. Now what that means is that we can actually not eat, which is called fasting, for days, weeks even. In fact, the world record for the longest time a person has gone without eating is over a year. Now, to be fair, when the guy started that challenge, he was really fat. He lost loads of weight, obviously, but he didn't die. 
the only thing he did have to do, which isn't cheating, but he did have to take this drink every day with some uh, nutrients that the body doesn't produce. So our body can produce some things, but other things we need to get from food. So apart from that, he didn't actually eat a thing for a whole year. Imagine going a whole year about eating. I can, I've only once gone a whole day about eating. And I will do some more fasting days like that in the future too, because there's some good health benefits. But anyway, that's enough about food, I think. <laughs> so post the topic that you want me to talk about. Could be anything. Oh, Ramadan. Yeah, they fast, uh, I think it's in October for a whole month, but they do eat in the evening, I think, but they fast during the day. I'm not sure. How am I faceless? My face is right here. Nah, Meg, I don't want to talk about myself. Something more interesting than myself. Yom Keeper. I don't know what that is. Quality's not great. Well, to me the quality's fine. I don't know if there's anything else I can do. Ah, thank you for the info about Ramadan. I didn't know that. There's bubbles. Uh, okay, somebody put something to talk about that was interesting, but I missed it. Oh, I forgot what it was. Oh, it's Mars, yeah. Who put the comment about Mars? <laughs> Another time, Nate. <laughs> when that face of me pops up, it's so funny. <laughs> Good job with the uh, artists were there. Anyway, okay, Mars. I'm really excited by the possibilities of Mars for a few reasons. Where should we start? Okay, let me give you a scenario. 66 million years ago, who were the dominant species on Earth? Well, it was dinosaurs, and there were loads of dinosaurs, and they've been around for 180 million years. That's, that's a really long time. Compared to humans, we've only been around for 140,000, 140, and our sort of ancestors who are a little bit different to us, that we evolved from, they basically, we were in trees with fur looking more like a monkey only a couple million years ago. So to think just in, in that short amount of time, how we've essentially taken over the world in many respects. I mean, we certainly don't control it, but we, we have the biggest influence and we have learned to survive in more places than most species, except like bacteria and small things like that. Uh, out of any mammal, we're certainly the most diverse species. So I was talking about the dinosaurs, they were around way longer. And in one single event, they were wiped out completely. And that was when an asteroid from outer space uh, landed on Earth, somewhere in the Mexican Yucatan Peninsula or somewhere near that, you can actually see where the crater is. Uh, I mean, if you actually went there, you wouldn't know you're in the crater because it was so, so big. But it's uh, an interesting story. Now, the, the impact itself <laughs> would have been devastating and uh, the effects it had on the climate for the next sort of thousands of years would have been what wiped out a lot of dinosaurs too. Really, any big creature on the planet at the time died. If you were a small rodent type creature though, you could survive because you could uh, go underground or you could survive because you don't need as much energy. There's that and... Uh, at the time, mammals, where we came from, were a small rodent type creature, something a bit like a squirrel or, uh, or even a rat. <laughs> uh, 
that's where we evolved from. It's a really fascinating story, but it's all because of one chance incident 66 million years ago when the asteroid hit. Now, that could happen again at any time. It could happen right now while I'm live streaming. I bet that would get a few more viewers on. <laughs> but we are tracking a lot of the asteroids and comets, a lot of the big ones we can see, but you know, space is massive and there are many more we can't see. And every day there are material from outer space hitting Earth. In fact, I've seen it in the sky at night. You can see these uh, meteor showers, but the best one I ever saw was this fireball. It was, uh, it was a few meteors that came past, just like a little blink, and I was like, wow, it's amazing. And, uh, and then suddenly, just fireball came, and that was obviously one that was either bigger or aiming towards us, so that's why I could see it more. But it, it was just a reminder that we're on an island or uh, moving around through a, a big universe full of other stuff and we're not just like this fixed place which is what it kind of feels like here on earth anyway i was going to talk about mars I, this is all the build up this is the background to it so essentially what i'm saying is we are vulnerable to things out of our control if a big enough asteroid came now there's not a lot we could do about it and in fact we would need a lot of time if we were going to say try and blow it up or uh a better idea would be to nudge it because if you blow it up all you do is create smaller pieces that still hit earth but if you nudge it with gravity for example if you put a spaceship into orbit around the asteroid the spaceship's gravity because remember everything of mass has gravity from me to this cheesecake everything has some gravity if it's got mass so a rocket around the asteroid would be enough to nudge it if and this is a big if, if you saw it in enough time in advance. Plus, you'd need the rocket, obviously, built and ready to go, too. Um, so, yeah, what am I saying? We're vulnerable. So, having Mars as a backup, if we could create a civilization that could live on Mars, and I think we can, and there are many people making it happen. In fact, just the other day, Elon Musk announced his rocket company was going to have people on Mars Mars by 2024. That's only six, six ish years from now. We're going to be around to see it. In fact, you and I, we could even be astronauts or one day we'll be settlers on Mars. What a cool thought that is. But it's going to be a really tough challenge because if you didn't know this, Mars, although it's uh, a rocky world like ours, it's smaller than us and its atmosphere, crucially, is thinner than ours. So the sun, the sun's radiation, the solar wind, that rains down on Mars' planet, a lot more of it gets through to the surface, which might mean we would build a human civilization underground on Mars, because then the ground would be another layer of protection. Or it means we'll have to create some sort of big greenhouse to protect us from the deadly cosmic radiation. You may have heard about the International Space Station. That's something you can see in the night sky. There are humans right now orbiting our planet in a spaceship, a couple hundred miles above the surface. And they, uh, the longest anyone's ever been on the space station is for a whole year. And that was kind of an experiment to see how the radiation and the lack of gravity affects a human body. Basically, it does, it damages it. As soon as you go into space, you're sort of dying. But there are ways to uh, reduce the effects or even to counteract them. For example, the people on the space station right now, because of the lack of gravity, they have to do a lot of exercise every day to keep their bones strong, because otherwise their bones literally shrink. Or to things like radiation, we could build rockets uh, with water in the walls because the water will absorb the radiation as it comes through. So there are solutions. We are smart enough uh, and ambitious enough to come up with solutions to make Mars a real possibility. You want me to keep talking about Mars? Loads I can say about Mars. 
Thanks, Jenny. <laughs> I'm going to keep talking about masks because I haven't geeked out about masks for a while, so. I'm sure you've seen the movie Martian with Matt Damon in it. That is one of my favourite movies. Courtney, you want to go to Mars one day? Oh, that's cool. Um, well, the way we would do it, and this is just sort of like the rough ideas that I'm aware of at the moment from the people actually building the ships and the sort of... Uh, communities that are actually going to go to Mars. I've just learned from them. So they reckon you'd have to send some resources ahead of time. Now, Mars and Earth are about, I think, might be 30 million miles apart. Uh, it would take about 18 months to do a mission to go there and back because certain points in the year, or, or every few years, Mars is closer to Earth than it is during the other years. Therefore, you want to time your mission to go when it's at its closest. But obviously, it takes time to make that distance. So when you take off, Mars would be further away. But by the time the ship gets there, Mars would have made up the distance. I mean, that's a pretty... It's a pretty crazy idea. Space is a huge place. You have to be very accurate with your rocket to head off into space and hope that when you get to a certain point in time, before your fuel runs out, that Mars is there to meet you. We rely on mathematics made by people long before rockets even existed. People like Einstein and Isaac Newton, who's going back a hundred or sometimes, in Newton's case, a few hundred years ago. And they came up with some simple mathematical equations that explain how these objects in our solar system move. They even explain stars billions of light years away. I mean, yeah, like E equals MC squared. Absolutely. Quite amazing, isn't it, to make a discovery like that that nobody else has ever figured out. I'd like to be able to do that. I think my way of doing it is I just love learning things. So I'm going to use my teacher skills, my teacher skills and my enthusiasm to share these things. And hopefully some of my audience will be people making the breakthrough. Hmm. I'm just reading some of the comments. I do miss some of them, and there's no way for me to go back through and see what, what you've commented. This cheesecake, so good. No, I don't play the guitar. This is uh, obviously not my house. This is their musical instruments. My brother's learned the guitar, though. He can play a few tunes on it. He's not as good as Andy, but he can play Let It Be from the Beatles. I once had a private performance from him for that. <laughs> Courtney, I'll go with you to Mars. Just uh, let's not be the first, OK? Let's make sure there are some other people there. They've already set up the house, the uh, greenhouse to make the food. They figured out a way to get water before we go. <laughs> In fact, we've sent uh, telescopes and uh, even robots that have landed on the surface to Mars to look for water. Because we, if we find water, hopefully we'd find life. And that would be really cool if there was other life on another planet. Because even if we found some life on that planet, no matter what it was, that would mean the chances that there's other life on other planets would go up massively. 
and that would increase the chances of us looking at oh, finding uh, alien life. So that would be extremely exciting. But another possibility, this might blow your mind, is what if we found life on Mars that had DNA like ours? Because go back a few billion years in our history, and Mars actually had oceans on the surface. Who knows if it had plants, trees, or even some animals there. And we, we, we know, even though Mars and Earth are separated, that there is Martian rocks that have made it to Earth from some collisions. So picture this. Imagine a Mars oasis filled with life billions of years ago. And then an asteroid comes down, smashes into the surface. That sends up a lot of debris. Some of it escapes Mars's gravity and leaves the atmosphere of Mars behind. But riding on those Martian rocks is some life that's managed to cling on. And then some millions, maybe billions of years later, that rock that once belonged to Mars crashes down into the seas of Earth carrying with it that life and that life that's now arrived on earth spreads out and becomes you and i and all life we see around us on earth so we might be we it's not ruled out we might be martians i mean we're not little green men but what a story what a possibility Marvin the Martian. <laughs> you would love to be a little green woman. That's an interesting fetish you have there. Talk about black holes. Oh, sure. Well, I was, I've been reading a book by the great Stephen Hawking. And his book is called A Brief History of Time from the Big Bang to Black Holes. And I've been learning about some today separately from the book. So I'll share what I learned today. We have found evidence of two ginormous black holes in a distant galaxy a few hundred million light years away that are so close, they are, the, they are only one light year apart and they are closing in. And we don't know exactly what will happen to these black holes, but it's assumed that they will merge into an even bigger black hole. <laughs> now, this is incredible for many reasons. Uh, first, I ought to explain what a black hole is and how we can see something that is black. Okay. Well, it's, first of all, first you need to know about black hole is that, one, it's not black, it's just that we can't see anything there. And it's not a hole, it's just, it's a point, well, this is what we, this is what we've come up with so far, is that a black hole is a former star that when it died, collapsed into an infinitely small point. So let's just say it collapsed into something this size. Picture a huge star, much bigger than our sun and it collapsed into a point this small. Think of all that matter squashed in. The gravity around this thing would be really intense. And the force is so strong that light, even traveling at 186,282 miles a second, can't escape the gravitational force because gravity bends space. That in itself is a mind-blowing place and astrophysicists joke that if an astronaut got, got near past the event horizon, the event horizon of a black hole is the point where light can't escape and uh, you would be spaghettified <laughs> because your feet would start spinning around the black hole faster than your knees, which would be spinning faster than your head and yeah, you'd get messed up. But you'd obviously die long before that point anyway, so don't worry about it. 
you might have seen some movies back in the 60s or 70s that have black holes that uh, are created on Earth or come, come and destroy our sun and eat up our planets. Because obviously you can't see the black hole. Um, you can only measure what the black hole does to the surrounding things that you can see. For example, if you look into the center of the Milky Way galaxy, our galaxy, which is only about 30,000 light years from where we are, you will see that there are more stars concentrated there. And if you look closely, you will see that there are some stars in the center orbiting around an, an empty, uh, orbiting around something, but you can't, there's no light coming out of that point. Now, the way those stars are moving and behaving, because we've been measuring them and tracking them with our telescopes, indicates that there must be something there that's huge and heavy. It's called a supermassive black hole. Because you can get black holes that, when, a, for example, when a sun dies, that are only 10 times, as, uh, mass, 10 times the mass of our sun, which means that all the things in the sun, all that stuff, there's 10 times more of it. Uh, obviously, they're a lot smaller because they've been collapsed, but still, they're not a whole lot bigger. So there are mostly black holes of that kind of size. But given enough time, they can uh, uh, basically catch more material. And the bigger they get, the more stars start to orbit around their gravity. Because as I mentioned, their gravity is ferocious. Nothing we found in the universe is as powerful as the gravity force of a black hole. Don't quote me on that, but I'm, I know it's up there, at least in the top 10 <laughs> or top three. So we found a supermassive black hole in our galaxy. It's amazing. We've, we've measured evidence of it being there. But you know, there are still people skeptical that black holes exist, because, and you can understand why trusting in something that you cannot actually see. However, this, no, last year, for the first time ever, we detected gravitational waves. So everything, including me and you, has gravity because we have mass and we emit waves around us and that's how other things around us know how to. But it's so small from my gravity, even the sun's gravity wave, gravitational waves are very hard to detect. We've not been able to do that. But a black hole, that is powerful enough. Even more powerful is when two black holes um, uh, merge together. And this happened in a galaxy a few billion years ago. But also because it's a few billion light years away, it's only just arrived here on Earth last year. And these two galaxies, um, in the event when they uh, merged together, emitted really powerful gravitational waves throughout the universe in all directions. And those ripples were eventually detected here on Earth by human beings. That's amazing. And how they detected it is even more amazing. They had like these kilometer long laser beams, one like that and the other one at a 90 degree angle. And they would shoot off and come back very quickly because they're going at the speed of light. And the difference in the time it took would tell you how much the gravitational waves have influenced it. And you're looking at measuring something like a human hair, like being able to see a human hair of a telescope between our star and the next nearest star four light years away. That's how precise they had to be. But they were, and we've since detected three, I think three or four in total. One was only a couple of weeks ago. We detected gravitational waves again. And the Nobel Prizes that were awarded over the last few days, one of them went to three scientists who helped create the machines and the formulas and equations to explain gravitational waves. So there you have it. Ev more evidence that black holes exist. It's hard to explain those events otherwise. <laughs> I 
a Nobel Prize. I'm not worthy of a Nobel Prize. That's very cute of you though, thank you. Did I see the magic school bus? Doesn't ring any bell. I know a song called The Wheels on the Bus. They go round and round. Hmm. That's right, mate. You know the song too. Anyway, let's go back to black holes for a minute. So I told you that we found a supermassive black hole at the centre of our galaxy. Now, don't be afraid because we are 30,000 light years away from that black hole and um, we, we won't be going near it anytime soon. Plus, the chances of there being a black hole that we haven't detected near us that will influence us in our lifetime, this is like uh, very, very extremely rare. Um, but there wouldn't be a whole lot we could do if we did <laughs> we did suddenly get sucked into a black hole. Um, what was I going to say? Black holes, black holes, black holes. Ah, yes. So, our galaxy has a couple hundred billion stars. Now, if you were to count to a billion, counting one a second, it would take you 31 and a half years just to count to one billion. So if you tried to count all the stars in our galaxy, you'd never make it in time unless you cheated and skipped a few. <laughs> so a couple hundred billion, this is a huge amount of stars and even more planets too. Now, all the stars in our galaxy are traveling together through the universe. And what's not known is whether the black hole ended up coming into the center of these stars in, in a galaxy and just got attracted to where the most stars were in the center, or if the black holes came first and they attracted other stars and that's what formed the galaxy. So how about that for a thought? Rather than being frightened of a black hole, you can see it as a sort of birth of creation in some ways, because without them attracting the stars to orbit around them, we wouldn't be here today. <laughs> in fact, every galaxy, and there are hundreds of billions of galaxies, just, just for a moment, just think about how many stars and how many planets are in the universe. A staggering amount. Think of all the opportunities. I, for a long time, since I've known about how much is out there, I've imagined being able to not travel in a spaceship, because that's too slow, but being able to teleport by like closing my eyes and then just imagining I'm on the surface of a planet and another star in another galaxy in another part of the universe. And I'm looking out and seeing the alien world and imagining life that might be on there. That's, that's a nice thought I have every now and then, anyway. It's a pretty damn cool universe we live in. My birthday is the 31st of May, 1994. So uh, you missed it. <laughs> I'm 23, in case you're about to ask that question. I love black holes. <laughs> they are interesting things. Very, very powerful. I'm going to change pace a little bit and talk about something else, I think. Wish I was an alien. Okay, I'll talk about aliens. I've already mentioned how we might be Martians. We might have been born on Mars. But before I talk more about aliens, how about this idea? It's called panspermia. Panspermia is the idea that life didn't originate on Earth. But it originated somewhere else in another star system, but then material like rockets, uh, uh, rocks or comets, asteroids, all those things, uh, left those star systems and then ended up in our star system and basically seeded life here. And now that could be happening all over the galaxy. Just, just imagine, because there is life we found on Earth 
that can survive in space because we've taken it up there and we've and it survived now how did that bacteria how did these these creatures survive in space if they've never even experienced space well that got us thinking that maybe they have in the past that's why they're capable of course it might just be a coincidence but if you look at how evolution's worked it tends to work a bit like this uh, there are two creatures of the same species. One has a, something different to the other one. And the thing that they had different gave them an advantage. So they live longer, had more children, and their difference got shared out to the survivors. That's why it's called survival of the fittest. Well, if there was nothing to cause these bacteria here on Earth to have that kind of survivalness, then where else could they have got it from? Well, then the only answer is space. So maybe they learn, maybe they came from Mars and whilst traveling through space, they learned how to survive there. And now they're here on Earth and they populated all life on Earth. That's a possibility. But the other idea is panspermia. So maybe 10 billion years ago, on one of the first stars in the Milky Way galaxy, there was some civilization of aliens there. Maybe there wasn't even a civilization. Maybe there was just some stupid aliens, but either way, they, they, uh, their planet got a, a storm of asteroids that came down on the surface, smashed into them and shoved a lot of the surface of that planet out into space. And some life was obviously on the surface of the rock that got blasted off. Well, eventually that, that asteroid with some life it left that star system and maybe continue to survive there for millennia and millennia and landed in another star system on a new planet and then it seeded life there on that planet and then maybe it happened again asteroids hit the surface debris went up into space life went with it into another star system and then populated it with life and then eventually came to our sun and populated our planet, Earth, here in our system some billions of years later. What, what a concept. It's, there are ways to make, to, there, is, there is evidence we could find to make that concept uh, our real reality, our real history. But for now, it's just a mystery. You took an evolution course. That's all I read. I didn't see the rest of your comment, whoever that was. What video do you want me to watch, Courtney? Estoy esperando. I'm waiting. Courtney Blake, I think it is. You said there's a video. I've only ever driven through France. Rise chocolate cake. Interesting. Charles Darwin, the man who came up with evolution. Interestingly, at the same time, another guy, I think called Arthur something, he also came up with a similar idea. And there was a bit of an argument about who came up with it first. But either way, Charles Darwin, what a guy, this guy. He, he managed to travel the world at a time when traveling the world was a lot more dangerous and arduous than it is today. And he would go and collect, uh, or he'd either collect species or he would just make notes of them and draw pictures. And he created like thousands of books and records of these species, of which there were millions. Like, for example, beetles alone, he, he found thousands of different species of beetles. And by comparing them 
And by, kept, by comparing the environments and the ecosystems that he found those beetles in, he came up with the theory of evolution. What a guy. <laughs> he had a pretty decent beard too. <laughs> Oh, I see, Courtney. I've uh, listened to that book. Neil deGrasse Tyson is one of my heroes. The way that he tells stories about the universe is clearly something I'm trying to emulate in my own way. I absolutely love the guy. Brilliant astrophysicist, but uh, it's a storytelling that's really remarkable. Uh, no, I have no idea why the Apple logo has a bite out of it. I actually didn't even notice that. <laughs> Yo puedo hablar a few languages. I mean, really, I'm only fluent in English and Spanish. But last year, I learned some Chinese. Ni hao ma. Uh, I can speak a little bit of Greek from when I went on holiday there. If Charisto, Paracolo, Yasu, in other words. Uh, French, Cheju de Volet, Au revoir. Um, but clearly, I'm very limited in those languages. I'm sure as I travel the world more and live in different countries, I will learn some more languages. Because if you can speak their language, you can hear their stories, which is something you can't do as a tourist. And by learning their stories, you get access to many, many more stories you otherwise wouldn't have heard. And that excites me a lot. This is why I'm here in Spain at the moment, because I want to really improve my Spanish so that I'm more than just somebody who can survive and be comfortable in a country, which I already can, clearly. <laughs> uh, but I want to be able to talk to people and ask some questions and share knowledge and in a way that at the moment is a bit messy if i do it now like i can understand 90 percent, no more than that 98 percent of what people are saying but there are a few words uh, but there are many words that i don't know plus when i speak i'm a little bit jumbled up so that's what i'm here to improve at the moment in fact, I got a friend I made in the local bakery and I go in at the moment every morning and we speak for about an hour. He learns English, I learn Spanish. That's one of the many ways. I've also bought this book here and that's in Spanish. It's the newest book, the newest movie with uh, Ray, Kylo Ren and all those. And I haven't actually started it, but I'll start it tonight. I learned a bit of French at school, Yelena. Um, I did three years of it, incredibly, although I, I don't really remember much other than I didn't like the teacher. Uh, she was very shouty. And my name is actually French. Beaumont, Beau is beautiful. Mont is mountain, beautiful mountains. And uh, you can trace back the Beaumont sort of lineage and they used to live in some mountains in France. So there you go. Before, um, before 1066, when William the Conqueror arrived, that's when, that's where I'm from, from people who arrived with him in uh, over a thousand years ago. So in some way, I've got French history. You've just inspired me to talk about humans sort of ancestry and history because I'm fascinated to learn about the wars and the different civilizations that were built and, and uh, the different religions they created and beliefs that they had and concepts about the universe and it's interesting how a lot of similar things happen in all these different places but what I want to talk about is how you can trace back through skeletons and fossils we found um, when humans learn certain things like for example uh, tools like spearheads and things like that and through all this archaeology we've done plus through DNA evidence from these fossils because you can their teeth survive and their bones survive and you can sometimes get lucky and get some DNA from that and Essentially, we know that 
about oh, a few tens of thousand years ago, every human, well, every Homo sapien lived in Africa. That's where we're from. And then at some point, Africa was connect, connected by land to Asia because the sea levels were different. And some wandering families made it across and they went on to then populate Asia, Europe, eventually the Americas. And when, for example, humans came to Europe, where I'm from, there were other human species around. How amazing would that be if they were still around today? They're called Neanderthals. There's some other ones that we found too as well, but Neanderthals were the ones who settled in Europe. They were these sort of stocky, shorter versions of us. And we actually all have a very small amount of Neanderthal DNA in us. In fact, that's not true. If you're from, if you're a white person from Europe, then you're likely to have a very small amount. You can actually measure how much if you get a DNA test. I think it's like uh, one or two percent max. That indicates that we didn't just kill off the Neanderthals because we probably ate them or we killed them off so we could have their land or their access to resources in that area and they eventually died out. We think because of Homo sapiens with superior technologies and things that we had and we were able to work together better. But possibly there was some inbreeding between the species. How else can you explain how we've got Neanderthal DNA? Or some of us do anyway. So there's an interesting thought. Would you have sex with a Neanderthal if they were alive today? <laughs> <laughs> I love history too. You know why I love history? Because I like finding out how we got to where we are now. I think that gives us a good idea and we can learn from previous mistakes and things that have worked to help make a better future. There's that. But also I'm just interested. Like why why do we do these certain things this way? <laughs> <laughs> you want a history date? Well, I'm not making any promises. I don't know if you count that as rejection. <laughs> I think I love you in French is te, te amo? That's Spanish. You tell me. Somebody said they hate history. Well, at school, I remember I didn't really like it. Apart from, <laughs> I can remember somebody called Claire. She was our teacher for a while. She was good looking, so I liked that class, but that was only for a short year. Other than that year, I didn't pay much attention to history. But after I left school, that's where I developed my interest for it. <laughs> Same for science, really. I wasn't a big fan of it at school. I think it's because of the way it was taught. That's why I'm not a teacher in schools, although I have been, and I probably will do again. But it's not my main focus at the moment. My main focus is uh, teaching online, because I can teach the way I want to teach. <laughs> Just reading some of your comments. <laughs> Okay, I reckon I'm going to do another 10 minutes, so if you really want me to talk about something, then let me know. Or, maybe even better, is put, put some, a topic that you don't think I could talk about, and then I will try and talk about it. <laughs> I love a challenge. Je t'aime, je t'aime, je t'aime. <laughs> the Claire topic. <laughs> That's for another day. Algebra. <sighs> Do 
Be more specific about nature. Name an animal or a place or a behavior, I don't know. But just a quick one about algebra. I remember I used to love counting maths. I was always the first to complete the quizzes and things like that. I absolutely loved the maths games we used to do. Then I did it at A level and algebra just absolutely bored me to death. I very, very soon lost interest in maths, sadly, at that point. Had they, though, taught me how algebra can be used to explain the laws of the universe, I would have been interested. Sadly, at school, they didn't. They just made you learn how to answer questions that didn't mean anything. And because there's no meaning, I really struggled to be motivated to do it. But afterwards, like since school, in my uh, when I have my geek out sessions about astrophysics and other things like biology, and I use algebra to explain these laws of physics and things like that, then I'm really fascinated to learn how they work. So um, there you go, see, I could talk about algebra. Come on, hit me up with something difficult. I think that's enough cheesecake for one night. A sea cucumber. Now, I might have this mistaken. I love cucumber, by the way. A sea cucumber, is that a species that's a bit like a sponge that lives on the surface, uh, not surface, the seabed, and they move very, very slowly? Well, I've seen a brilliant time lapse of the starfish and sea cucumber. I think sea cucumber. If not, it's a sponge type creature. Well, a few different sponge type creatures. And they can't see because they don't have eyes. Yet they know how to move, and this time lapse is of the, of the seabed, and it's obviously sped up, and it shows how they move around and they react to each other, searching for food because they use their other senses. Imagine if we couldn't see. I mean, some of us, unfortunately for them, are blind, but they still they they see the world, if you know what I mean, in a different way, and that's interesting. Or that's time perfectly into genetic engineering. So what if we could enhance our vision so that we could see X-ray light or infrared light so that at night time it'd be a lot easier to navigate uh, in the dark, especially if you're out in the wild, for example. But I don't know if that would make it easier to sleep in, in the wild. I've camped a few times. Uh, recently, the most recent time, I camped in the Lake District on my own on a mountain when I left my family to go off into the mountains and I slept in a valley and there was these annoying goats that didn't really scare me, they just irritated me, constantly making noise and coming near my tent. I said, get out of it! Um, but there's been other times, like when a badger kept bothering me when I was just in a sleeping bag. That happened this year. <laughs> That's a good story. Uh, <laughs> but whenever you try and sleep in an unknown place, a new environment, the noises can sort of sp spook you a bit. Or at least, even if you're brave, they're enough to distract you and make it harder for you to sleep. Because you can't fight your internal instinct to survive. Like if you hear a rustling in a bush, it's better to assume it's a lion than to assume it's just the wind. Because if it is the lion, it kills you, even if it's only one in a hundred times. So even though most of the time it's probably just wind, it's better to be ready for everything. That's that's how that's something we've evolved as an as our survival instinct. Um, but I was talking about genetic engineering. I think yeah, fight or flight. That's right. Genetic engineering that really is an controversial topic. Uh, I haven't I haven't learned much about it for a while, but. I do know that they recently successfully uh, took the sperm and the egg from a man and a woman and in a petri dish they grew it and they managed to engineer out a specific uh, disease or illness out of the genetics. So that's one single gene out of billions of them and it grew successfully. 
they obviously didn't let it grow into a baby because that would have just been wool. But uh, they proved that it can work, and they've done it on animals many times. Like we've grown mouse with a human ear because we've changed the genetics, I and mean, that's when I saw that for the first time. I was like bonkers, but essentially, because pigs are similar, have similar internal organs to us, like kidneys and hearts and things, we can actually transplant transplant from theirs into ours. So we could grow pigs with by editing their genetics to basically make a better human organ or better yet we could even engineer a sort of clone of us and in fact there's a movie about that and then whenever we need a new part we can just take from this <laughs> i don't like that idea i don't think we should do that i think every human should be allowed to live and diversity is great there are, i think there are other ways to prolong life and make it and to heal us that don't require cloning <laughs> No, me neither, Meg, as I was just saying. In fact, in the movie, it all went tits up, so. <laughs> Although you shouldn't base all your uh, principles on movies. Cuts in the restriction enzyme, uh, then that was a bore. I'm not sure about that enzyme, but. Soon, maybe not uh, for another 10 years or so, but soon the technology called CRISPR to edit genetics will be so cheap that every school will have it. And as a science project, rather than making volcanoes or things, you'll be able to grow your own, oh, excuse me, your own creature, but edit its genetics. Maybe you'll even come up with new creatures in school. I'd probably go back to school if I could do that. <laughs> Twins got cloned. Well, interestingly, they're identical twins, my little brothers. Um, but there was a problem that in the womb, Sammy, who's a little bit bigger, he was getting more nutrients than Sean, and Sean wasn't getting enough. So they were actually uh, pulled out of my mum two months premature. They were tiny little things. They had to live in little incubators in the hospital for a couple of weeks before they were safe enough to, to live. Quite, quite amazing that they survived because we have amazing technology. Um, but what was I saying? Oh yeah, they're, they're identical, but they're not. What I mean by that is that they look different to me, clearly. But to people who've never seen them before, they look identical, apparently. Um, but their genetics are. So all the billions of letters they got from mum and dad paired up, they have nearly all the same. Uh, I don't think they could possibly have them all the same because I think surely there'd be at least a couple of differences, but there, there's nobody in the world more similar to, to them than each other. <laughs> yeah, their personalities. I think I've seen you comment on their YouTube channel. I, I know they make some, some videos. <laughs> I'm actually going to make videos with them in Christmas. Are you looking forward to that, Meg? That would be, I'm really looking forward to that um, because I love them to death. Uh, in fact, this kind of storytelling I've done with the twins so many nights in the past. <laughs> okay, I'm looking at that hour mark. I'm going to end it soon after that because I want to read my book and other things before I go to bed. So... Why don't I just say what I'm going to do next? I've got one more video that I made the other day. That's going to come out tomorrow. And I will be live streaming as much as I can, but probably with a little bit more structure than this one. I'm still just sort of figuring out what I want to do. Um, it's all good practice, and I'm enjoying it while I do it. Uh, this has really helped me get through my biology homework. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Sophie. I've never seen a comment from you before, so. Uh, Welcome to the channel. Hope you stick around. And, uh, oh, you know what? I'm going to unshamelessly plug my own channel. If you guys have friends who you think would enjoy it even half as much as you and I do, please share it. Because even though I try and not look at the numbers of my subscribers or on the views, I still do care about it. Because the way I see it, the more people 
I can have this positive influence on, the better. So, yeah, why don't you go around school or work or whatever you're doing tomorrow and just sort of give me a shout out. And I'll watch the subscribers soar tomorrow evening. <laughs> right, well, there's an hour. I'm going to say goodbye, but I'm going to have like 20 seconds to read your comments because you guys are awesome. So, uh, adios, au revoir. Uh, what was it in Chinese? Yasu in Greek. How do you say goodbye? Oh, Zaitien. <laughs> oh, some of you already do it. That's brilliant. No wonder my channel grows so much. Thank you. Jetem, Yelena. Salam. I'm guessing that's Arabic? Not sure. For goodbye? Don't know. Goodbye, Jetem, Tem. I'm going to practice that one. <laughs> in fact, I'll learn French when I'm. When I've mastered my Spanish, I'm going to learn French after that. I will keep spreading love. I hope you keep spreading the love. That's great. Goodbye. Oh, Jody, another new name I've not seen before. Welcome. I am cute. Am I really, though? <laughs> Certainly not an ambition of mine, but I appreciate the compliment anyway. Right, that's enough. Goodbye.